Thank you, Brother Doug. If you didn't get a tingle up your spine during that, you need to check your tingler. Because <laughs> something is not right. Thank you, Brother. Wonderful rendition. So today, brothers and sisters, I'm very excited to share with you what the Holy Spirit has been speaking to me as I've prepared for these short chapters. And so we're going to continue our study of 2 Corinthians in chapters 7, 8, and 9. And there is such a, a peace that you get when you're able to read and understand and unpack a little bit of what Paul is trying to say here. And so I'd like to just get right into episode number four. You'll see that the title of this message is Purify Yourselves in Unity and Generosity. There are two things there that Paul says that we need to do. Yourselves. Purify yourselves. This is not passive. It's not something that God is going to do aside from our activity. He wants us to purify ourselves in unity and generosity. It is a message for us today as much as it was for the Corinthian church. So let's see how Paul says we can do that. Let's read 2 Corinthians Chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. And if you'll follow in your Bible, I'll read out loud. Since we have these promises, dear friends, let's purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Make room for us in your hearts. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have exploited no one. I do not say this to condemn you. I've said before that you have such a place in our hearts that we would live or die with you. I have great confidence in you. I take great pride in you. I am greatly encouraged in all of our troubles. My joy knows no bounds." For when we came into Macedonia, this body of ours had no rest, but we were harassed at every turn, conflicts on the outside, fears within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the comfort you had given him. He told us about your longing for me, your deep sorrow, your ardent concern for me, so that my joy was greater than ever. So now what is Paul relating to the Corinthian elders and the rest of the church body there? He is telling them that Titus had come to Macedonia. Paul was supposed to meet him, remember, over in Troas, but Titus didn't show up. He was late getting out of Corinth. And so finally Paul moves on to Macedonia in northern Greece and they finally get together there in either Philippi or Thessalonica. We're not sure exactly which church there uh, that they got together. And Titus sends or relates to Paul the great news. Yes, they have taken your letter to heart that you sent, which was 1 Corinthians that we went through. They've taken it. They've taken it to heart. They are sorrowful for the things that they've done that have taken them away from your message and the contentions that were going on. And they're coming together in unity as a church. And so Paul is saying, I knew you could do it. I knew the spirit in you would allow you to come together in unity. And he says these things. First of all, he says that you need to be perfecting holiness. Now, what does that mean? In, in the very beginning there, he says, 
in verse 1, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Well, you know, when I read that, I was reading a commentary, and the commentary referred me back to what Paul had just talked about in Corinthians 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 18 just a few verses before this and he says to them come out from the unclean says the Lord Almighty and the Greek there is kurios pantocrator pantocrator isn't that a great word you need to learn one Greek word and if it's uh, if you can it's pantocrator because it sounds so great this is the same word in Hebrew that the Bible uses for the Lord of hosts you've heard in, in some of your Bible studies in the Old Testament, and the Lord of hosts was with them. That's the hosts of heaven. He is the five-star general in charge of all the armies of heaven and in charge of all of the church on earth. He is the curios pantocrator. And that is the same God we serve. He's not a namby-pamby personage. He is... Lord Almighty. And so we need to be perfecting holiness. We need to be more like him in his bedrock character. Can you have colonels and other generals and majors in your army that don't agree with the five-star general? Can you have that? Well, Patton found that out in World War II, didn't he? He had come across to Ike's viewpoint and when he did he was able to help us win World War II if you know your history of World War II and so we need to get on board with our general as a matter of fact theologian Albert Barnes wrote in his commentary every Christian should endeavor to make just as much as possible of his privileges and to become just as eminent as he can possibly be in his Christian profession. Have you ever thought about that before? Every Christian has a Christian profession. This is your highest profession over and above your temporal profession that you've ever had or ever will have. And so we all need to be just as eminent. What does eminent mean? Top of your game. You're eminent. You're at the top of the apex of what you're born to do. You need to be eminent. And so, he says also, besides perfecting holiness, make room for us in your hearts. For Paul and the uh, men who are sacrificing for them. And, and he says, hey, and you've done that now through Titus telling me the good news about how you've come along. And he says, the God, God who comforts the downcast comforted me when Titus came with this great message from you that we're all in unity. And if you don't know why I use the triangle for unity, talk to one of the deacons. They'll tell you. We've, we've gone through that quite a bit. Or come see me and make sure you bring a cup of coffee. So, let's go to 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 16 and read those verses. <clears throat> Even if I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, I see that my letter hurt you, but only for a little while. Yet now I'm happy, not because you were made sorry, but because your sorrow led you to repentance. For you became sorrowful as God intended, and so were not harmed in any way by us. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what concern, what readiness to see justice done. At every point you've proven yourselves to be innocent in this matter. So even though I wrote you 
It was not on account of the one who did the wrong or of the injured party, but rather that before God you could see for yourselves how devoted to us you are by all this we are encouraged. In addition to our own encouragement, we are especially delighted to see how happy Titus was because his spirit has been refreshed by all of you. I had boasted to him about you and you have not embarrassed me. But just as everything we said to you was true, so our boasting about you to Titus has proved to be true as well. And his affection for you is all the greater when he remembers that you were all obedient, receiving him with fear and trembling, and I am glad I can have complete confidence in you. So what Paul is doing here is he is giving this waterfall of wonderful process that the people went through as they read the first letter from Paul that was brought to them by Titus to tell them that they should stay strong and firm in the faith that Paul had preached to them. And so they went through this process, sorrow leading to repentance. Have you ever come through sorrow that leads to repentance. That's why humility is the first thing we're supposed to have in our hearts as Christians. Because arrogant people won't be sorrowful. Have you ever known anything like that? Have you ever known a person that says, I couldn't possibly have done that, what you're saying. That arrogance that says, I'm not going to take, I'm not going to be sorrowful for anything I did. Well, that is the beginning of of the end, not the beginning of the beginning. So sorrow led to repentance and then to earnestness, eagerness to clear themselves, indignation at the wrong that they had allowed to go on, alarm at that, and then longing and concern to be ready for justice and come back to the narrow way. And this was a great victory. And Paul says, I, have, I now have complete confidence. And that word complete means everything that I thought I needed to hear from you, I heard through Titus coming back and telling me what you said and what you're feeling and how your unity is in the face of what happened. And so... Titus has become the endorsed mediator. And Titus goes back to that church. And he stays at that church even though Paul and the rest of the team go on with the offering from them to Jerusalem later on. And you'll notice I talked about complete confidence. Once again, Paul does one of these nine things. You remember previously, Paul is doing things in nines. And now here we have it again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And that is, we find that as a pattern through Paul's uh, letters. Now, we need to do a little bit of a prelude story catch up before we go to 8 and 9 very quickly. So, in Jerusalem at this time, it has come to the 50s, the mid-50s, and what has happened is the zealots for the Jewish faith have come to the fore. They've gained power, but Rome still owned Jerusalem, but the zealots were running Jerusalem. And they uh, were giving honor to Caesar as the Pontifex Maximus. The Pontifex Maximus means what? The chief priest. He was not only the king, the emperor, but he was also had proclaimed himself the chief priest. And so all the priests were underneath him and they were sort of holed up in the temple precincts. And the Sakari, the assassins with the short swords, were running Jerusalem. 
the zealots. And so there was per persecution of the Christians. The Christians were being actively now by the mid-50s persecuted by the Romans and by the zealots. And they were being uh, dealt a hard blow and their leaders were either killed or banished. Anybody that would come out and speak of Jesus as the Lord and God of the Jews as the ultimate king under the Romans, as a Christian should say, we, God has brought us to this and we must act like Christ in the middle of this, this lack of leadership that is civil. And they were banished or killed. And there was Christian exile coming out of Jerusalem, going to places where they didn't have any home. This had been their home their entire lives. And now they're being exiled out by their own people under the iron hand of Rome and the, the Sicarii, the assassins that would take over. And so this would lead more and more and more until A.D. 70, 15 years later, when the Romans would finally have had enough of the Jews. And so this is the thing that was happening. Why do I bring all this up? Because Paul is about to say, we need your help. We need a generous, you know, the people in Corinth were some of the wealthiest people in the world at this time. It was the crossroads of trade of the entire Mediterranean world. And people, even the people that were in this little Corinthian church, had come out from them but had retained their businesses and their wealth and their, their, their things that were going on there to do uh, merchandise. And so they were able able to give. But I want to point out before we read that this also applies to us today. From Voice of the Martyrs we get these statistics. Now if you haven't been sitting up straight and listening so far, sit up straight and listen. Because this was in the 12 months of 2023. There were 365 million Christians persecuted in 60 countries. While we sit here very blessed, we shouldn't feel guilty about being blessed, but we should understand this is going on in places where communism and socialism and the other ills of the secular world have taken over. How many leaders were killed or banished in this world in 2023? 4,995 Christians were killed for their faith last year. And exiled, approximately 129,000 Christians were exiled from their homes last year. That should make us sober, ladies and gentlemen. Not only sober for them and to give what we can to these Christian brothers and sisters but it should make us sober for our who are our leaders are they leading us into a leadership that will eventually take us here because we don't want to get involved and soil our hands in politics I think not the thing that bothers me most about all of this as a minister of the gospel, it alarms me that last year in 2023, 3.4 million people died in America. 3.4 million people died last year in America for one thing or another. How many approximately were dead in their sin? Two million. Two million. Let that just sink in for a minute. Sometimes in the cloistered area that we live in of beautiful northern Georgia, we don't get the impact of what's happening out there. 
So, 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 17. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to testify, I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. And here is my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. So... I'm going to stop right there because I'm going to segment it a little bit more. Paul says that in gifting to others, it's according to blessing and need. What blessing have you gotten and what is the need that you've heard about of those around you? And that the poor should give as much as possible. But the gift is acceptable according to what one has. You don't need to feel guilty if you're not giving as much as somebody else. You don't need to sell your house or any of those other things. But you need to search your heart and find out what you're giving. You know, I'm so pleased with this church and the leadership of the church in the fact that before I ever got here, they said, well, you know, Pastor, uh, before you got here, we sort of put it in our bylaws that the pastor doesn't get a vote on the finance committee. He can sit there, he can give, you know, some advice and stuff on the finance committee, but he can't vote. And I said, praise the Lord! <laughs> Boy, that takes a lot of pressure off of me. I don't know who gives what. I don't want to know who gives what. I don't want to know any of your particulars. I just want to love you as brothers and sisters. And boy, does that, you know, the deacons have to take all of that stress of knowing that and our wonderful treasurer back there, Brother Miles. And so your gift will be acceptable to God according to what you have. Don't be harsh on yourself. You know, we've talked about before that our goal by 2031, the whole Christian church's goal by 2031 needs to be a million points of light so that there are little churches all over the globe that are preparing their places of worship and all the information in it, like our tribulation box back there, that tells those who will come into the church after the rapture, here's how you can come be with us. You just have a few short years. You may only have a few short days. Get right with Jesus as your only Savior. And Jesus told us to go into all the world, and so that's what we try to do. So, as Paul is telling them, the poor give as much as you're able. Gifting is acceptable according to what one has. Then he goes into this little parenthesis there where he gives us a little bit of information. He says, Titus plus brother one plus brother two. Let's read that. <clears throat> For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. As verse 13 is coming up if you're following along. 
Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you're hard pressed, but that, that, that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need. So in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. Then there will be equality. As it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. I thank God who put into the heart of Titus the same concern I have for you. For Titus not only welcomed our appeal, but he is coming to you with much enthusiasm and on his own initiative. And this is where he put plugs in the other brothers. Listen to this. And we are sending along with him the brother who is praised by all the churches for his service to the gospel. What is more, he was chosen by the churches to accompany us as we carry the offering which we administer in order to honor the Lord himself and to show our eagerness to help. We want to avoid any criticism of the way we administer this liberal gift for we are taking pains to do what is right not only in the eyes of the Lord but also in the eyes of men. In addition, we're sending them with us we're sending with them our brother who has proved to be to us in many ways that he is zealous and now even more so because of his great confidence in you. As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker among you. As for our brothers, they are representatives of the churches and an honor to Christ. Therefore, show all these men the proof of your love and the reason for our pride in you so that the churches can see it. Okay, who is he keeping secret here that are the brothers? Well, if you know how to kind of put the pieces together, you find that it's not a secret at all. So let's unwrap it real quickly. So, brother, you know, we, we, he's talked about Titus. So brother number one is most probably Luke. Why? Because Luke has been with Paul on this mission all the way through Macedonia, Achaia, and then down and around to Ephesus, back to Jerusalem, back through all of the churches, and now in Macedonia where they are. And so Luke has been there in all the churches. He's been sort of the... Uh, the, the fellowship coordinator as Paul has been the preacher. And so he says, he's praised by all the churches. That's a hint. And then for his service to the gospel. We know he's got to be a servant. So he's Paul's attache. And we're going to learn that he's going to be with Paul soon in Jerusalem and Caesarea. He's the one that is the Gentile that is taking all the Gentile offerings to the Jews. What better person to do it? Not a Jew, but Paul being the Jew, him being the Gentile, represented by all the Gentile churches, bringing an offering to help the persecuted and the families of those who have been killed and exiled. See how that's coming together? And then, brother number two is most probably Apollos. Why? Because Apollos had been there before, remember? He stayed there after Paul left in Corinth. And he was evangelizing and he was growing the church. And finally he got so uh, disappointed in their disunity that he left and went over to Ephesus and told Paul that that was happening, which helped Paul write the first letter. Got our bearings? <clears throat> and so, it said, Paul says he's zealous. Well, that was Apollo. And his confidence in you is great. Well, how does somebody who had never been there before and didn't know them, how could his confidence in them be great? Now, hearing from Titus and coming back to the church. So what is Paul doing? Boy, he's a great leading general of this particular movement. Because what he's doing, he's sending two other generals to them that have been through everything that relates to them with Paul to say, we, you know us, you know me, Apollos, you know me, Luke, we've been here. The Apostle Paul may not be here, but you know us and you know we're bringing the word of the Lord from Paul in this second letter. 
See how he bolsters his second letter with his two top generals that they love in the church. And so that's what's happening. And then, of course, Titus is, makes up the uh, trinity that he, Paul is sending. And Paul says in the letter, he's my partner. So you can trust him. So we're asking you to give money. But we're not asking you to give money for me. We're not asking you to give money for us. We're asking you to give money to the Lord so that the Lord can help his people and the original Jewish church that needs to still stand. The Messianic Jews that still need to stand. Well, we have that in our world today, don't we? We have Messianic Jews both here and in Israel that need to survive that need to stand according to God's plan, and they will. Now, we're going to chapter 9 really quick as I finish up here. Chapter 9 has 15 verses, and we're going to see something here under the title of Giving to Others Equals a Blessing. There's no need for me to write to you about this service to the saints for I know your eagerness to help and I have been boasting about it to the Macedonians telling him that since last year you and Achaia were ready to give and your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action but I'm sending the brothers in order that our boasting about you in this matter should not prove hollow but that you may be ready as I said you would be for if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared we not to say anything about you would be ashamed of having been so confident so I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things at all times having all that you need you will abound in every good work. As it is written he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply the increase and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. So what Paul is doing here is he's saying, look, through your unity and generosity, you're going to bring the church together. The Jews who have looked down their nose at you, the Jews who have been in Jerusalem, the center of everything godly, and have been not liking, much less loving Gentiles, will see this generous gift brought by a Gentile and a Jew back to you and say, this is from your brothers and sisters who are equal with you in the faith and they're helping to bring you through this time of persecution. And the whole church is coming together and Paul says by way of prophecy that that's going to happen. Now, really quickly here, there's a word there that I want to uh, bring out for you when it says in... Uh, Verse 7, each man should give what he's decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That word cheerful there is hilaros. The word loves is agapei, and that comes from agape love. And it's agapei means the sacrificial kind of love, the love that means I, 
I take a bullet for you. And so um, this sacrificial God loves a cheerful giver. Hilaros, the pinnacle of merriment. That's where we get our English word hilarious. And so he loves that. What does that mean for us if we put it in to one of our sentences? God sacrificially gives, meaning it's a sacrifice, a sacred act. God sacrificially gives to a no regret, over the top giver. You want to be a, the apple of God's eye? Be an over the top, cheerful giver. In verse 8, he says, So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in good work. In other words, because you're showing this support for unity of the whole church under Jesus Christ, under God, then God is going to sacrificially make everything work out in business and in family and in the, the life that you lead, that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in good work. You're just going to keep on going and keep on growing and keep on being blessed by God. This is what your Bible says. Now, I'm going to go through this very quickly because my time is just about out. Paul gives his heart. I, I really encourage you to, 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 to defend Paul. Paul never in any of his letters does not have the heart of Christ. And so if people badmouth Paul, they're badmouthing Jesus. So you tell them if that happens, zip it. What does Jesus give us in Matthew 5, 1 through 12 as the bedrock attitudes of God? Some of you all who have been here for a while know this. It's on our little wristbands that many of us have. Bob's holding his up back there. So yeah, some of the wristbands that you have that we talked about before. These seven things are the bedrock of God's character. We ask, oh, we hear so many sermons. We hear, oh gosh, he read three chapters today. It just about knocked my eyes out. Well, I'm going to help you now. I'm going to say, learn seven words and you've got the bedrock of God's character. Humble, caring, gentle. Remember, blessed are the meek. That's a horse that's been bridled. He's gentle. Giving, loving, truthful, and counseling. Can you memorize seven words? Any of you that don't have a hundred IQ uh, out there, I'll give you a little grace on that. Humble, caring, gentle, giving, loving, truthful, and counseling is the bedrock of what God is like. And so there are three that are inward. Humble, caring, and gentle. That's something you have to do on the inside through prayer and through soul searching and through preparing yourself through God's word. And then the, the last four are outward. See that? How they're outward? Giving, loving, truthful, counseling. It's like Jesus was. He was humble, caring, and gentle when he was praying to the Lord. And he did that so many times as we read in the Gospels. But then he was giving, loving, truthful, and counseling with people like the woman at the well. Right? We have those stories. You have those stories. Don't hide those stories. Get them out there. At least to your family. I mean, you probably wouldn't want to go to Longhorn today and start standing on the table. But, you know, um, get it out there however you can. So what about us? This is what preachers call the application. There are 168 hours in a week. You have 60 hours to sleep and eat. That's the average in America. That we, we eat and sleep 60 hours during the week. I say keep doing that. 40 hours for work. Now some of you are retired, but most of you have already told me that you're working harder in retirement than you did when you were working. 
And so I'm still giving you 40 hours for work. And then you got to spend at least 20 hours with family. Doing something for family, helping, because God wouldn't have given you a family if you're not supposed to nurture that family in his love. That still leaves you 48 hours, if my math is correct. Sometimes it isn't, but if my math is correct, you got 48 hours left when you do all of that. Now, many of you, especially in this congregation, give eight hours a week of your talent and time to the church to do various and sundry things. So... Take eight hours a week off of that, at least still leaves you 40 hours. What are you doing with those 40 hours? Anybody want to stand up and volunteer what they're doing with those 40 hours? No, I'm not going to ask you to do that. But I'm asking you to search your heart and are there some things that you can shave off so that you can do more work that is eternal rather than temporal? I did that this very last month. I now save over an hour ever going to the barber. <laughs> huh? What am I going to do with that? I'm going to do something more eternal with it. Okay? So, treasure. Now, this is not you guys. You guys give more than this. You guys are more than this. But I'm just telling you, the average that I've been able to find from all the Barna research and all of the statistics, religious statistics is that the average person gives 3% of what they clear in church. 3%, not 10%, not 20%. And offerings, the average is 1%. Everybody keeps 96% for themselves. And I just encourage you, try to just keep a few more percent going toward the Lord's work. And it doesn't have to be right here at the church. You know, God, through the Holy Spirit, will let you know what you're doing. And I know a lot of you are helping friends, you're helping family, you're helping, uh, you're doing things that I don't even know because you're not bragging about it. And so, the Lord accepts that. So, God says, I shall be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the curios procreate. Procre Whatever that is, that Greek word. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. So, these are the seasons of our lives. Yeah, Pantocrator, thank you. Um, these are the seasons of our lives. What about our time, talent, and treasure? God others self this is a journey we're on and this journey is not going to last forever how much time do you have left for it to be God others and a little bit of self always needs to be a little bit of self till we go to be with him next week we're going to have a great treat when we go through chapters 10 and 11 in the charter of the church. So, would you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you that you've given us this plan from the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul that we are to have unity and generosity. That our unity will help us with our generosity and our generosity will help us with our unity. And so we thank you for your word and for your presence in Jesus' name. Amen.